Good morning, church. It's wonderful to be with you again. And uh, I'm so thankful for all the amazing things that are happening. Well, I have a very interesting title today on this sermon. It's called The Crucifying Dilemma. And I want to say that in our lives today, there are many dilemmas that we face. And um, we all have to face a dilemma at one time or another. And some we really agonize over. And the word dilemma means that we face a difficult choice. Or we have a predicament. And we really don't know what to do. We have a difficulty. And I want to say that life is full of these type of things. But God is giving us his grace to overcome every dilemma. And this morning, we're going to focus on one man's dilemma. And we're going to see how his dilemma speaks to us today. And his name is Pontius Pilate, a very infamous name. And you might say, oh, I don't have a dilemma like Pontius Pilate. But I'm here to tell you, we all have dilemmas. And the, way, the things that happen to him, we can learn from. And we can also learn from Jesus who stood under that authority of this worldly man at this time in his life. So before we begin, let's just close our eyes and pray. Father, we want to thank you that the dilemma that you faced in going to the cross was a choice by you. And Father, as we look now at the circumstances of your trial, and Lord, we can't even begin to understand how could anybody put the Son of God on trial? How could anybody put your servant in that situation? And yet, Lord, it was your plan that brought him to that point. But the truth of the matter is he offered himself freely. Help us, Lord, to learn the lesson of dealing with crucifying dilemmas in our lives. Be with me this morning, and may the words that go out, Lord, be ordained by you to bring revelation and to bring transformation and to bring hope to us, Lord, as we face our personal dilemmas day by day. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Actually, we do have a choice every day, self-crucifying or else what we choose to do if we don't crucify our own selfish desires is that we always end up crucifying the word of God. And it, I call it the crucifying dilemma, and each one of us has to work through this each day. But as we're looking at this now, I want us to put the context in place. Where are we? We are now standing and listening into the very trial of Jesus Christ. And we are standing in the Praetorium, Jesus' trial venue in Jerusalem, and the original stone pavements you can see are now under the city. And you can go down there and you can walk on these pavements. And this name, the pavement stone, will come up as the very place where Jesus was sentenced. And this place you can still visit here today. And I had an opportunity to do that way back in 1998 as we took our children there. We have all experienced watching someone go through dilemma. And I had a friend in Africa, and uh, she was working as a cleaner. And she came to me one day and she said, Mama, I have a very perplexing dilemma. My daughter is expecting a child, and it's, she's not married. What? do I do? 
And I had to sit down and pray with her and spend time with her because she was so disappointed. She was so disappointed. But now, what was she going to do? How was she going to treat the daughter? How was she going to receive this new child coming into the world that didn't come in the way she had wanted this child to come into the world? Some of us have faced the heart-wrenching dilemma of the doctor telling us that we have to stop the life support for one of our loved ones. Some of us here are college students and we need to choose a college and one college has accepted us, but I'm waiting and hoping for acceptance from that other college, but if I don't make my decision for this one, I have to wait for another six months. How many know what that's like? You were waiting, but there's a problem that comes in. We, we have to wait and we have to work our way through. Now, the dilemmas that we're going to focus on today are the dilemmas that Jesus can help us with. I call them the moral dilemmas that we actually face each day. My friend Sarah was facing a dilemma. How do I handle my daughter? What do I say? What do I do? And I had to tell her, what does the word of God tell us? She made a mistake. But are we going to allow the mistake now to be upon the child? Depends on how we interact and how we look at the dilemmas that God uh, brings our way. And I'm happy to say that um, they have a good relationship and this little child was welcomed into the world with joy and acceptance. But now we're going to look at chapter 18 to get the context for what we're going to step into. We're in the palace now of the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. And here is what transpired from in chapter 18 as a lead up to where we're going to be going. And what was transpiring is this relationship between Pilate and Jesus, a discussion and a question time and interrogation time. Have you ever been interrogated? Have you ever had to be in an interview where you felt like it was an interrogation? <laughs> you go into a simple job interview and there's 10 people to interview you instead of the two or three you were expecting. And here are the statements that take place. And Pilate now, remember, he's the sixth Roman governor and he's under a very cruel, cruel emperor named Tiberius. And this man, Pontius Pilate, he has a wife. And she's very instrumental in this trial of Jesus. Her name is Claudia Prosula. And you can find her name in Matthew 27, verse 19. In fact, pastor just did a whole sermon on biblical marriage. And this Pontius Pilate's wife actually tried to intervene. She tried to intervene to warn Pontius Pilate, her husband. She tried to help him. And Pastor just got finished saying that as wives, we are helpmates to her husband. And she tried to deter him um, from continuing on his course of action. And we'll find out what happened. So the Roman government was full of intrigues, plots, betrayals. If any word came out of your mouth that might seem like insurrection to the ruling emperor, you were done away with instantly. There was no insurrection, no rebellion that was tolerated. And we need to understand that that is the environment that this story is set in. And Pontius Pilate has been appointed governor of Jerusalem at this stage. So let us look at the conversation. Picking it up in verse 33, Pilate went back inside the palace and he summoned Jesus and he asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And you have to 
really look at what Jesus responds in verse 34. Is that your own idea, Jesus asked him, or did others talk to you about me? You know what? Jesus is very concerned about our ideas. What are our ideas about him? What are our ideas about his word? He's not too concerned about what other people have to say, but he wants to know what you think. You see, God is a creative God. He's given you a mind to think and to rationalize. And he's very interested in your own personal thoughts about him, about his Father, about the Holy Spirit. And so he challenges him, is that your own idea? Or did others talk to you about me? And uh, Pilate is getting a question when he asked a question. He's not getting an answer. And so I can see him retort back in verse 35. Do you think I am a Jew? What is it you have done? And immediately he goes on the defense. Do you think I'm a Jew? What is it you have done? He points his finger at Jesus. And uh, Jesus responds to him, my kingdom is not of this world. If it, if it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. Jesus is affirming to Pilate that he doesn't need to worry about him. He's not here to take Pilate's position. He's not here to create a rebellion. He's not here to rouse up the crowd to fight for him. That's not how Jesus operates. Jesus stood through his trial with dignity and often silence. And this really, really irritated Pilate. Why is this man remaining silent after all these accusations are going against him? Why is he remaining quiet? And I want to tell you that there are no defenses for a lie, but silence speaks louder than words. And it can. And when you're in a situation where you're being accused, sometimes silence is the best remedy. And we're shown this. And I used to live by a prison as a young child. And I learned that a guilty prisoner really did a lot of this. Talk, talk, talk. Because the talk was their defense mechanism. It was the smokescreen to hide the guilt. The innocent people were normally quiet. <laughs> I learned that from being the daughter of an RCMP officer, and I have found that it to be quite true and quite relevant to everyday life. The people who talk the most and the loudest and the most often, often have something they're trying to create to hide something behind. So Jesus often stood in dignity without answering this worldly governor. In verse 37, uh, he says, okay, you are a king then. And uh, because Jesus said, my kingdom is not from this world. So he said, well, you are a king then. And uh, Jesus answers him in 37, you are right in saying I'm a king. I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Jesus' purpose was to testify to the truth. And I want to say here that this is one of the purposes that God has saved you for. His plan is that you will testify for him. And I'm excited because we've got 29 people who are going to go out to the many nations around us. And what is their main purpose? 
to testify, to testify about the reality of Jesus Christ in their lives. Now, this word testify comes from the word martureo, to bear witness. And it's the root word for martyr. And we know what that word is. It's people who die as martyrs for Jesus Christ, who refuse to recant their confession and their belief in him. The testimony to give evidence, to give a good report. It means I will testify and I am willing to give my life for what I believe in. If Jesus is not worth dying for, he's not worth living for. The early Christians understood this. They lived under the whole environment of persecution. And right now, Jesus is on trial And he says, my purpose is to speak the truth. Well, truth is an interesting word. Aletheia. It means not a merely spoken truth. It's it's actually truth in the moral sphere. Divine truth that is revealed to man. And it is straightforward truth. Truth is always, I find, straightforward. (laughs) In God's word, you sometimes have to dig to get all the riches and all the truth out. And that's what I love about doing my research is digging out the beautiful treasure that is in God's word, his truth, which helps us to establish our purpose and how to deal with the dilemmas that we have to navigate through in life. Um, Pilate states, what is truth? This is probably one of the most famous statements in the Bible that Pilate says. He says, what is truth? Jesus has just told him, I've come to testify of the truth. Everyone who listens to me listens to truth. And now Pilate says, what is truth? What is truth? And I can remember one of my friends uh, had a bunch of children playing outside, and the children got into, a, got into a little tussle and a little fight. And one of the little boys, and they were arguing, and, and the one little guy was lying, and, and so one of the little boys says, tell the truth. You're not telling the truth. And the little boy turned around and said, well, what is truth? <laughs> what is truth? And recently, after a public meeting here, Someone came to me and they said, I don't know what to believe. I just don't know what to believe anymore. And I felt my heart had compassion on him. Truth. Is it our dilemma? Do we stand and honor God's worth, the truth? Or do we listen to what other people say? You see, Pilate... (laughs) And this is what all unbelievers will say. What is truth? And why are they asking? They don't have the moral truth as a foundation from which to guide them. God designed us for truth. He created us for his truth and not lies. And guess what? That's why a lie detector works. You know, when you have a criminal and you want to make sure he's telling the truth in court and he's going to give evidence and they want to make sure that the witness is true. They hook him up to all these, you know, gizmos and he's got these belts around his arm and and if he doesn't tell the truth, he begins to sweat and he begins, his blood pressure goes up. And I I can remember one friend of mine, we, we, we had to confront someone and, uh, So we, you know, kindly confronted them about the problem, and they got absolutely angry. They went beet red, they got angry, and they stormed out, and uh, I knew immediately that he was guilty. (laughs) Because if he wasn't, he wouldn't have reacted that way. And so that little liar detector thing they put on, then they asked the question, did this happen? And if the person is telling the truth, the little needle just stays straight. But if there's a lie, the body registers it. There's a lie. The body 
tells you when there is a lie. Because God never designed you for a lie. He designed you for truth. Because truth is in alignment with the entire way he created the universe. That's what he designed you for. And that's why we react when there's a lie. We sweat, we turn red, we get angry. They're, they're, it's your body telling you, don't do that. That's not comfortable. I don't like it. <laughs> Your body's telling you, I don't like lying. Okay, but sometimes we're not very good at listening to our own bodies. <laughs> and we have to learn that. And we learn it as children. We learn to avoid those uncomfortable feelings. So the universe was designed and is operating on truth. Live in truth. Live by truth. Live for truth. And then we will have peace. And then there won't be conflict. And then there won't be war. And we won't be living in a fog. And we will have clarity. And we will have vision. And we will not be in a dilemma where we don't know what to do. Well, Pilate is now in this quandary. And his solution is, to give the crowd a choice. And this is the last two verses before we go to our text. And so he gives the crowd a choice, and he says, but it is your custom for me to release to you a prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews, he says, in verse 39? And they shout back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now, if you know anything about Barabbas, he was the leader of a big rebellion, and he murdered people. He was a murderer. Everybody knew he was a murderer. And I want to say, the crowd, be careful of crowds. They can get a murderous spirit going. They preferred a murderer over the Son of God. They preferred the lie over the truth. And this is something that we deal with daily in our workplaces. We deal with this issue of truth, of righteousness, of integrity. Who are we representing? God has designed you for truth. He's designed you for righteousness. And when we take that step towards truth and righteousness, God meets us. And he meets us to such the degree that he solves our dilemma, and he even blesses us in our dilemma. That's the beauty of who God is. He will take a step to us if we will stand up for his truth. Yeah, mob justice. I've experienced that in Tanzania. We had a, we had a, you know, high walls, and we were all, we had a guard that we kept, but every once in a while, somehow, a thief would get in, <laughs> and this thief had been in our yard. He'd grabbed something and he jumped over the wall to the outside. But somebody on the outside saw him coming over our wall. And in Tanzania, as soon as they see that, they cry out, Wheezy, Wheezy. And everybody comes running out of their house and they chase this thief. And they chase him down and they beat him to death. That's called mob justice. So now this guy got out, and everybody's crying, wheezy, wheezy, and he looks at the crowd, and he looks at the wall, and he jumps back in to our compound. <laughs> and, 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 and the missionary, we weren't there, but another missionary was there, and the missionary, you know, was protecting him, and the crowd outside was saying, give us that wheezy, give that wheezy to us. We want justice. And the missionary was protecting him. And the whole community was so upset with this white missionary who wasn't living by their rules of justice. We didn't know what he'd taken, but it wasn't worth dying for. It wasn't worth dying for. So, mob justice is no justice at all. But now Pilate, to appease the people, because he realizes the whole trial is going against Jesus. And so he decides to take this act, and he, in verse uh, chapter 19, 1, Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. 
And then the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they clothed him in a purple robe. And they went up to him again and again, saying, Oh, hail, you king of the Jews. And they slapped him in his face. I mean, this is difficult for us to handle. Someone going up and slapping Jesus in the face. But you know, if you look back at the way the Jews treated their prophets in the past, then many of them were murdered by the Jews. You see, mocking God's sent ones has not ended, my friends. Mocking his prophets and his ministers And Pilate did this to try and diminish the crowds rabble-rousing and their shouting. He was trying to help Jesus in a way. But he felt like, I can pacify them. If they see, if I scourge Jesus, if I put the crown of thorns on his head, if we mock him, maybe that will satisfy the crowds. We have to be careful to get involved in crowds. We have all wounded Jesus. We've all had our opportunity to mock him before we knew him, some of us. And it was out of ignorance and it was out of our unbelief. And there is this old hymn that says, how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there. Until it was accomplished, his dying breath has brought me life. I know it is finished. Hallelujah. He has finished it. He has taken away our guilt and our sin. He's taken away our mocking and our bad behavior. He paid for it all. When we want to pacify our own friends about our standards of truth, what do we do when we're faced with a dilemma? Every time we deny Jesus, every time we don't stand up for the truth, my friends, it's like a lash going out and hitting our Savior again and again. God used his wounds. He remained silent. But I want to tell you today, when we don't choose the way of truth, when we don't choose righteousness, when we don't choose honoring his word and those who deliver it to us faithfully, we are, we are striking another blow unto him who paid it all. Let us, my friends, not succumb to being pressured by peer pressure, to do that. And you know, Pilate says in verse 4, I find no basis for charge against Jesus. And then Jesus came forth in verse 5, he was wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Even Pilate diminished Jesus because Jesus just told him he was a king. But Pilate couldn't give him that honor. He said, Behold the man. As soon as the chief priests and the officials saw him, they shouted, crucify, crucify. But Pilate answered, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. Three times Pilate declared Jesus' innocence. Three times publicly he declared, this man is innocent. I find no fault in him. He has committed no crime. And yet the crowd yelled, crucify, crucify. God never wastes the pain 
and suffering of his servants. Christians died so bravely with dignity in the arenas in Rome and around the world, and I have stood in Tunisia at that great preserved arena and read there the Christians that died. They died for their faith. And the way they died inspired those watching them to the point that those, many of those watching them, gave their lives to Christ and also died for him. And if you go to Tunisia, you can see the spot where one of the first martyrs in North Africa, only a few hours from here, named Perpetua, died for her faith in Christ. Every year in March, thousands of Christians all over the world go to that place because it's marked with a pillar where she gave her life for Jesus, for her faith. You see, sacrifice inspires. A crowd shouting only incites. It doesn't inspire. Big difference. I want to be known as one who had something to sacrifice for my Lord. I want to be an inspiration to the next generation that are going to have perhaps some bigger challenges than people my age are going to face. We know it's coming. The word is true. There is going to be an outbreak of persecution as the world has never seen, Jesus told us. Are we ready? Are we ready? Are we willing to pay the price? Are we willing to sacrifice? Are we caught up with the crowds inciting and shouting and they don't even know actually what they're shouting for. Well, verse 7 tells us something about Pilate. The Jews insisted, now we have a law, and according to that law, Jesus must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. And when Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. It tells us that fear was ruling Pilate's life all along. Because it says he became more afraid. You can only be more afraid if you're already uh, afraid. And so we realize that this man was ruled by fear. But uh, he was a fear of the emperor. He was fear of traitors. He was fear of the Jewish leaders. And he really became fearful when suddenly Jesus' name came up as the Son of God. Now there was divine fear that started to grip him. For the first time, he realized he might be opposing God himself. But he was obsessed by his power, and he was fearful of anyone else having power. And interesting, he says then, where do you come from? Now he's got to ask Jesus, where do you come from? He's got to find out, is he really from heaven? Because if Jesus is from heaven, then he's opposing God. And guess what Jesus does? He remains silent. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? <laughs> you know, the world thinks that it has power over you and me. But I want to tell you today, as believers and servants of God, worldly men and their worldly actions have no power over a true believer. Hallelujah. It has no authority and no power over those who truly believe and stand for Christ. And Jesus corrects him, and he says, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. You see, Jesus corrects Pilate, and he's correcting you and me. And he's saying, the worldly authorities here don't have the final say over your life. I, as your Father in heaven, as the King of creation, I have the final say over your life, and he has the final say over my life. Hallelujah. We are not at the whim of the world, my friends. If we love him, if we're aligned with his purpose, if we are living our lives true to him, 
He is the one that stands for us. And we need fear no man and no governor and no government. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And Jesus now responds. Therefore, he says, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. How interesting. Yes, Pilate, you've sinned, but there's a greater sin. That's amazing. God does have our sins kind of categorized. <laughs> I just thought all sin was the same. But Jesus is saying, no, there is sin and there's greater sin. The greater sin was the guys that were scheming and plotting to overthrow. They were the ones handing over. Pilate was just there because of his position. Yes, he was afraid. Yes, he wasn't standing for what was right. But the greater sin was those who had plotted to do this. He was at the moment making decisions. These people had planned how to manipulate the whole situation. Well, you know, what is sin? What is sin? It's handing over God's people to non-believers, unjust judges. Who do we fear? Are we fearing man like Pilate? Pilate tried to free Jesus, but Jewish leaders shouted in verse 12, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar's, and anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. So he made Pilate, th these Jewish leaders made Pilate afraid. What is sin? It's trusting in the world's judgment. Pilate sits now to judge God's only son. You see, this was the nail that ended Pilate's dilemma. He feared Tiberius, the emperor, would hear about Jesus claiming to be a king. He did not know. Pilate did not know. He was facing the king of kings, the lord of lords, the king of creation, the lord of salvation was right there in front of him, but he did not know it. He, need, he didn't need to fear the emperor. He needed to fear the God of all creation. And I want to look at this word sin. Hamartia. Sin is a failure. And it has a self-origin, self-persuasion. It is not faith-based. Sin has no faith in it. If In faith, we believe God for something. In sin, it's an action we take outside of God's will. It is not faith-based. It misses the mark, and I've got these two targets here. One is hitting the mark, and that's what God has for us. He wants to shoot us like arrows out of his quiver, and we go flying through our destiny to hit the mark that God has given us. Are we hitting the mark of his purpose? Do we live for his purpose or our own ends? And hitting the mark true means we are aligned with his purposes. Our words, our actions line up with God's word. And you can be sure when that is happening, he is going to help us to hit the mark. So we need to be careful that we don't look for a crowd to agree with us. <laughs> we need to make sure that we don't plot or scheme, but we trust God. So Pilate is now sitting on this judgment seat, and there's the stone pavement. And you can see in the next picture, there's the stone pavements again. In Aramaic, it's called Gabatha. And it was the day, in verse 14, of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said. And in verse 15, the crowd, they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate? responded. And the chief priest said, we have no king but Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. They chose the world government over the prince of peace. They chose worldly ways to deal with dilemma rather than God's truth and God's word. And this is a challenge to us today as we face these things. But I want to tell you 
Jesus came at the right time and the right hour to offer himself as God's Passover lamb. That was his plan. Just at the time, just at the time when the sacrificial lamb had to be slaughtered, on this day, on the Passover feast, Jesus was handed over. He timed it. He offered himself to be in divine alignment with the sacrifice time. That was his purpose. You don't do that by accident. You do that by divine design. You plan it. You plan your life. Behold, the Lamb of God, John said, who taketh away the sin of the world. And in verse 16, finally, Pilate handed him over to be crucified by them. You see, Pilate's dilemma was solved. He feared man. He kept his position. He was the judge. He twisted, listened to twisted truth. He listened to what others said. He dishonored God's authority, and he handed over God's son to be judged by the world's system. Is our dilemma solved? Is our dilemma solved? We need to ask ourselves that question. And in verse 16, the soldiers took Jesus away. And as I look at the application of what we've talked about today, there are some nots and there's some do's. Let us not hand over what is holy to the profane. Let us not exchange the gifts that God has given us for what is profane, what is unholy. Let us use our lives to honor him. Let us not engage in schemes of emotional control. Let us not sacrifice truth on the altar of people-pleasing. And let us please not be like the Jews who politicked to get their way. You see, the world crucified Jesus using their worldly methods. But that's not the method God has given us. We don't use those kind of methods to move to our destiny and the promise. Let us rather, in our dilemmas that we face, maintain Jesus' purpose to testify for him. Let us follow him in truth and silence versus shouting because he's the way, the life, and the truth in John 14, 6. Honor God by honoring his servants, those who preach and teach as we're com we are commanded to do so in 1 Timothy 5, 17. You see, God's authority is final, not the worldly authority. And we're reminded of that when we go out as our dear brothers and sisters will soon step out into the different nations around us. And he said, Jesus said, all authority has been given to me under heaven and earth. Therefore, go. We can go when we know who is the authority. Jesus Christ himself is the authority. Next, we need to ensure that Jesus is our personal Passover lamb. Is he your Passover lamb? Personal Passover lamb. Have you acknowledged that he was the only sacrifice acceptable to God? He wants to be your sacrificial lamb today if you have not asked him into your heart because he still comes to you and me today today in this hour he's looking for you and me he's saying I don't care if you were the mocker if you were the scoffer if you were the one scourging me I've made a way for you to have this eternal life, to have this amazing love. God wants to solve dilemmas according to his word. Receive him today, and the dilemma of sin is finished. <laughs> he wants to guide you through every dilemma. He has the solution. Don't let the world make you look for their solutions. He wants to be your solution provider. Thank <laughs> you.